off for this evening, can you please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Phil Starr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very unusually, I've just been in the pub down the road. <laughs> and, uh, no, just as I walked in the door, you know, uh, you, you do like to be kind to people that are on their own. And there was this very handsome looking young boy sat at a table all on his own, looking terribly depressed. So I sort of popped up to him and I said, you're, you're, you're looking very sort of uh, down in the mouth. He said, I'm terribly lonely. So I said, well, will you have a drink? He said, I'll have a double brandy. I said, no wonder you're fucking lonely. <laughs> I thought, what a drink, you know. So I bought him a drink. I said, perhaps, you know, when you've had your drink, you'd like to uh, come round to my place and listen to some records. He said, suppose I don't like the records. I said, you can always get dressed and piss off home, can't you? <laughs> It was most unusual though because while I was stood at the bar, because obviously he'd gone by then, and a, a nun walked in. And I thought, you don't often see nuns in public health, or perhaps she's collecting. She went straight up to the bar and she said to the barman, Do you think I could have a double gin, please? So he gave her the double gin and she knocked it straight back. She said, I think I'll have a refill. Well, by the time she'd had 14, <laughs> I was curious. <laughs> So I said, excuse me, uh, Mary Magdalene. I said, it's very unusual to see a lady of your calling knocking back those gins like you've been. Or oh, she said, they're for medicinal purposes. They're for the mother superior's constipation. I said, but you're swigging them back. She said, oh, I know. She said, when she sees me, she's going to shit herself. <laughs> You know, there was a very nice little Irish fella stood at the bar. We got chatting and he said, excuse me a moment. He said, I'm just going to go over to that girl on her own and see if I can buy her a drink. So he went over to the tables. This girl sat all on her own and he said, excuse me, madam. He said, but uh, could I be buying you a drink? So she said, well, now let's put our cards on the table straight away, Paddy. She said, I don't like to accept drinks under false pretenses. She said, I'm a lesbian. He said, oh, no. he said what's a lesbian? So she said, well, you see that blonde girl at the end of the bar with the big knockers? I'd like to take her home and strip her off, throw her on the bed and make mad, passionate love to her. He said, good God, I must be a lesbian as well. <laughs> you know, I've got a friend, Vera. Oh, she's lovely, Vera. And I was down the bus stop this morning, and uh, actually we arranged to meet down there. And there was a woman at the bus stop, oh, she was crying her eyes out. Oh, she looked terrible. She was in a terrible state. And you never like to sort of go over immediately to ask them what's wrong, because you get involved, don't you? But she was sobbing so hard, I mean, I had to go over in the end. I said, excuse me, love, I said, do you look so upset? What on earth is the trouble? Oh, she said, my husband's been burnt. Oh, I said, not serious, I hope. She said, oh, they don't fuck about at the crematorium. <laughs> I wish I had Nars now. <laughs> and of course, I was talking to Vera, and you know what it's like in these sort of bus shelters? There were dozens of people waiting for the bus. And unfortunately, poor Vera, she, she passed wind. Well, it echoed round this bus shelter. Well, there was a real posh geezer and his wife stood in front of us and he turned straight round and he said, how dare you fart before my wife? Oh, what? I'm sorry, we never knew it was her turn. So I properly upset Vera. So I said, don't worry about it, love. I said, I'll tell you what, when we get down to town, 
We'll do a bit of shopping. I said, we'll pop in for a meal. Go into the pictures for a couple of hours. It'll cheer you up. We got in the pictures eventually. Oh, it was a beautiful film. And halfway through the film, I noticed this fella came in and sat next to Vera. Ten minutes later, she's digging me in the ribs. She said, Phil, that fella next to me is playing with himself. I said, well, ignore him. She said, I can't, he's using my hands. <laughs> I said, well, move back three rows. She said, oh, do you think it'll stretch that far? <laughs> Because Vera's a good sport, you know. She's the type you can go on holiday with, you know. Last year we went to Spain. I didn't get on very... I didn't like it very much. But where we went, you know, hardly anybody ever spoke English. And I noticed everybody kept saying to me, one as notches, one as notches. And I didn't know what they were talking about. So I was in this bar on this particular evening. I said to the barman, I said, excuse me. I said, what's all this one as notches business? So he said, well, it's Spanish for good night. So I said, oh, how so stupid of me. So on our way back from the bar that night, back to the hotel, I saw this fella walking towards me, so I thought, oh, be friendly, you know. So I said, buenas noches. He said, piss off, you Spanish bastard, you. <laughs> Have you ever been in these hotels in Spain where there are dozens of German tourists? You can never get round that pool, can you? You can be out there at six o'clock in the morning and it's packed. Well, by the Thursday when we were there, I was determined. I got up when the lark was singing. I think it was a lark and it shit on me twice, I don't know. <laughs> and I sat by that pool all on my own. Well, eventually it filled up. Well, I noticed stood next to me was this very, very attractive German fellow. I mean, he was good looking in the briefest of briefs, posing on the side, you know. I thought, well, I'm not looking, but I had a quick shifty. <laughs> and he sort of poked me with his toe, you see. So he said, you are English? I said, oh, you're terribly observant. <laughs> so I said, yes, I am. So he said, I am German. So I said, yes, I had a feeling you might be. And he said, and we are very athletic. So I thought, I'm going to get a demonstration here. I know I am. Sure enough, he went up on the high diving board, jackknifed into the water, did 16 lengths of the bath, flicked out on the side. He said, how was that? I said, you see nothing yet. I thought, I'm not letting the British down. Well, I got up on that high diving board. <laughs> I did 16 somersaults, completely by accident. <laughs> Well, I did 32 lengths of that bath underwater. <laughs> Come out on the side, I said, follow that, Fritz. He said, that is wonderful, honey, and where on earth did you learn to do 32 lengths of the bath and all underwater? I said, I used to be a prostitute in Venice and the police are so hot out there. <laughs> But I love those trips out that they do when you're on holiday. I always go on the excursions. And you know, when we, we went to, uh, to Tunisia, and they do these trips out just to the edge of the Sahara Desert. And I went on one, I was very interested. And we got to this, like, this little nomadic encampment full of tribesmen. And I happened to be talking to one of these Arabs, and he spoke quite good English. And I said, uh, excuse me, I said, I've noticed, John, looking round, there are no women in the encampment. So he said, oh, no, he said, when we are travelling in the desert, he said, the women do not come with us. So, you know, being a queen, I was said to him, well, you know. I said, what do you do for sort of horizontal refreshment? <laughs> so uh, he said, every Friday at six o'clock, they bring 300 female camels into the encampment. I said, surely you don't cohabit with camels. He said, well, needs must in the desert, you know, when there is nothing else. Well, just that, I looked at my watch, and it was almost six o'clock. And all of a sudden I heard this voice, the camels are here, the camels, well, he shot off this chair. 
I said, there's no need to hurry. I said, there's 300 of them. He said, I know, but you like to find a good-looking one, don't you? <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, can you welcome Dockyard Doris. Yeah. I'm ever so upset. I thought I'd come down to Brighton for a couple of days and upset. But it's Fergie, you see. She's upset me. She said to me, Granny, she said, I'm very worried about my body. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, Ferg? She said, well, she said, my, my bosoms aren't very big. What can I do? I said, well, there's plastic surgery. She said, well, I'm not bothered about that. She said, I said, uh, well, years ago in Brighton, well, Hove, actually, we used to, <laughs> no, we used to come down here and they had a marvellous thing called um, Isal. Isal toilet paper. It was very rough. It was before Andrex, before, you know, all that. And I said, if you rub Izal between your titties, it makes them big. So Fergie said to me, Granny, do you think it'll help me? I said, well, always something for your ass, dear, for a start, I said. <laughs> no. You see, the whole family, I can say it now because I'm amongst friends, but the whole family is peculiar. Is that Princess Anne, she lives in that Gatcombe Park, 42,000 acres with all the animals. Queen Mother was around there about, oh, about five, five weeks ago having a cup of tea. Little boy, Anne's youngest, young Mark, been watching all the animals in the farm. And they always say, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. He's only seven. And he came skipping to the kitchen. He said, Mummy! And Anne said, Yes, darling. He said, You know the big black bull in the bottom field? And Anne said, Yes, dear. He said, He just fucked the white cow. <laughs> the Queen Mother's top set flew right across the fucking room. <laughs> Anne took him by the ear hole. She took him out to the, to the kitchen, to the pantry. She said, don't you ever speak like that in front of your great-grandma again. He said, but mummy, it's nature. I don't give a fuck, said Anne. <laughs> well, she's been on trade fairs. She says, when your great-grandma's here and something like that happens, you say, mummy, the big black bull has just surprised the white cow. Well, 15 minutes later, they pumped the Queen Mother's cushion up. Give another cup, cup of old grey tea, horny man special. <laughs> Little boy came skipping into the kitchen again. He said, Mummy! Queen Mother's cup and sauce was going like the fucking clappers. <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> and Anne said, Yes, dear. He said, You know the big black bull in the bottom field? And Anne said, Yes, dear. He said, He's just surprised the white cow. <laughs> Has he, said Anne. He said, yes, he just fucked the brown one, which I think is happy when you think about it. I mean, because the whole family's peculiar. When do you think no, please? <laughs> about a week ago, Her Majesty was driving back from Goodwood Races with Fergie in the coach. Open land out. Like you get a black pool, you know, when you're being camp, you know. <laughs> you've all done it, you know, you've all started thinking, fuck up, you know. <laughs> and they're sat there in the open land, and they get to Windsor Great Park. And it's a big park, Windsor Great Park, full of trees and bushes. And they get to this... <laughs> you've been there, have you, dear? <laughs> And they get to this bit where there's all these bushes hanging over the path. And all of a sudden, a jeep appears. And it's not been in the papers yet, but I can tell you as your friends. There were four men in this jeep.
with baraclava helmets, jungle greens, and big heavy boots. Like the Vauxhall Tavern on a bad night. <laughs> They stop the coach. They said to the Queen, Give us all your money! Got guns. She said, Oh! <laughs> I don't carry any money on me. I'm the Queen. Oh, you, you know her, don't you, dear? <laughs> they said, Well, give us all your jewellery then. Well, she said, All my jewellery is in the Tower of London. They made her and Fogey out of the coach. The poor Queen at the front with the white wig and the knee breeches on. They shut her, threw her body onto the floor, jumped into the coach, whipped the horses three times, and galloped off over the horizon. And there was the Queen and Fergie walking back to the palace. And Fergie said, that was a near one, ma'am. And the Queen said, yes, it was. And she said, but Fergie, weren't you wearing a string of pearls? that was bought for you for your 21st birthday. And Fergie said, I was, ma'am. But when I realized they were hijackers, I ripped them off, shut them up with minge. <laughs> <laughs> and the queen said, pity we hadn't got Margaret, who could have saved the coachman as well. <laughs> I'm very upset because, I'm sorry, one of my corgis has died. Oh. He wasn't one of these flash corgis you see round Brighton. <laughs> he wasn't sort of a, a real corgi, a, a, a creme de la creme corgi. He was a little English mongrel corgi from the East End. Black patch on one eye. No tail, no teeth. He wouldn't bite you, but he'd give you a nasty suck occasionally. <laughs> Deaf, castrated, answer to the name of Lucky. <laughs> no, it's all very well you being a dog. But being a deaf dog's no good, is it? Some bugger shouts din dins. You don't hear anything and don't get anything. <laughs> Someone said to me, Mom, get yourself down to Harrods. They've got a sale on. So I went to Harrods when they closed the shop one afternoon about half past five. I went to the pet department. Sorry. <laughs> and I bought this doggy deaf head for my little Lucky. £492 it cost me. I took it back to Clarence's house. I strapped the batteries under his chest. I put the hearing aid in his ear. And ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in that doggy's life, he could hear. And it heard the dog next door barking. And his little stump, because they don't have tails. <laughs> his little stump was going like the clappers. And I could hear the bees buzzing. And it could hear the birds singing. And it went running round the garden. And it went down to the bottom of the garden where the old oak tree is. Cocked its leg up. Pissed all over the batteries and blew its fucking head off. <laughs> I said, don't upset yourself. <laughs> no, you mustn't. Get yourself out and get another animal. So we went to another pet shop. And the sad thing is, it's a medical fact, one stutterer will start another stutterer off. And the geezer in the pet shop, he stuttered. And I was all in a quiver and I said, good morning, sir. I'd like to buy an animal, please. He said, certainly, madam. What do you fancy? I said, I said how much are the birds? He said, well, the parrots. The, the ones on the top shelf are banned, and the ones on the bottom shelf are 50 pence. I said, well, why are the ones on the top shelf dealing with the ones on the bottom shelf? He said, that's simple, they're on higher purchase. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I said, but can they talk in the bathroom? I said, I fucking talk better than you can, Mrs. For a start, I do that now. I'm not very happy. But I'm very lucky. I've got my family. Even though the hat is... <laughs> even though the hat is falling off my head. No, no. I'm very lucky. Bless them. I went to Holland the other week. Lovely people, the Hollanders. <laughs> Queen Mother went there in a Rolls Royce. And in Holland, they have very narrow streets. We were driving down a little narrow street, and I was at the aide de camp. <laughs> aide de camp. Not aide de camp, thank you. <laughs> As the Queen Mother sat there, you know, waving. And then down the same street came this other Rolls Royce. And it was Queen Juliana of the Netherlands. Her Royal Highness. Queen Juliana of the Netherlands. And the car stopped about an inch away from each other. And the Dutch driver got out and said, Move back, please, quickly! And the English driver said, I'm sorry, I can't. The Dutch driver said, Excuse me, move back, please! I have a VIP. And the English driver said, So have I. The Dutch driver said, I have Queen Juliana of the Netherlands in here. And the English driver opened the back door and said, what do you think? I've got a bag of fucking shit in the back here, dear. Now open the fucking door and move out of the way. See you again. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please welcome now Nikki Young. Well, thank you so much. I must say that uh, coming from Scotland, from a small village in Fife called Achtermachti, uh, we, had a, we didn't have a lot of television, didn't have a lot of entertainment, but I did have 17 sisters. Daddy said, in fact, if we'd had another one, we could have had an indoor golf course. And um, <laughs> my sisters, of course, they, they put upon me, you know, being down in London. They expect me to have them for holidays and have the family when they want to do whatever they're doing, you know. And, and two of my sisters, well, they're chalk and cheese. One's quite glamorous. She's got a very good job, married to a very wealthy man. He's something in the city. And the other one, poor soul, he's on the dole, lives in Hackney, has a very hard time of it all, you know. And uh, they were talking the other day, and I, I was sort of earwigging. I was making a cup of coffee made with three kinds of beans. And um, you've seen that advert, haven't you? Big Butch, Gareth Hunt, and Eunice with light stops, sitting down the garden, sitting there. And down the garden path comes Diane Keane in the micro mini and the, the acrylic jumper with the nipple sticking through, bouncing down. And she announces, three people went like that to me in the supermarket this morning. <laughs> now, And you blame them, you know. <laughs> Television adverts, they're so strange. Do you remember that old one for Everest double glazing with dear Ted Mould, poor old soul? He used to do that wonderful, the feather test. He said, uh, there is no draft and completely soundproofed. I will prove it with the feather test. And he goes over to the window and he drops the feather. He says, start her up, Bert. And Bert starts the machine off. If it was soundproofed, how did Bert hear him? <laughs> But my, my two sisters, I was saying, I was making the coffee and I could hear them chatting away and the one said, oh darling, she said, uh, I envy you. She said, yes, I can understand that. She said, I, I know, I'm terribly chic and smart. I have the best of everything. I have, I have Janet Regger step-in panties. <laughs> she went, do you? She said, I do. How do you get that? She said, well, whenever I need anything, I, I just say to Richard, I say, darling, and when he turns around, I, I'm there with no panties on at all, and he gets terribly embarrassed. He says, oh, please, Samantha, I can see your money box. I said, well, darling, it's because there's no housekeeping, and I need money to buy panties. And he gives me 50 pounds. She went, yeah, yeah, I've tried that. I sat there one night with no knickers on, with a feet on the mantelpiece. <laughs> she said, oh. She said, I'd sneezed, I almost had the gyro in the fire. <laughs> and, <laughs> she said, we were watching Coronation Street, and, and suddenly he just, he, something happened. Bet Lynch sort of bent over, and he went, oh, look at them bleeding tits, look at those. 
Bugger me, girl, you've got no f***ing drawers on. I said, no, I can't afford to buy drawers with the money you give me. He said, where's 50p? Buy a comb and tidy yourself up. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got some very nice neighbours, I have to say. There's a very young girl just moved in next door to me. She's, she's 19 and been married three weeks. And she came to see me the other day and, and she said, um, she said I, I'd like to speak to you because I, I look upon you as the, the clear rainer of the block. I was a bit annoyed about that because I, you know, don't wear wings. And um, <laughs> can you imagine? Yeah, now, it's quite a while ago, it's a few months ago now, we, we were in America, I don't want to be flashed, but we were in New York, and we were watching the telly. Now, the ads there, they advertise absolutely everything. In the middle of a cookery programme, suddenly someone will come on and say, I have no pain anymore from hemorrhoids. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, that's distasteful. And I said to the guy I was with, I said, thank God we don't have anything like that in Britain. We get back to this country, there's Claire Rayner doing those adverts for those sanitary towels. I thought, only in Britain can they use a woman that hasn't fucking needed them for 20 years. <laughs> but I digress. So she came in, this young girl, Myrtle, and she said, uh, she said, I, I've got a problem. I said, what is it? She said, well, you know, I've, I've just recently got married. I said, I know, dear. I said, congratulations, Myrtle. She said, well, last night was the first time I'd ever seen him in the nude. I said, well, you've been married almost a fortnight, dear. How is this possible? She said, well, he likes to make love in the dark. And last night, the light switch stuck, and I saw him in the all together. I said, well, what's your problem? She said, well, I know where he's, um, where he's, and I thought I'd be helpful. And I said, Willie? Bobby? Johnny? Winkle? She went, no, I know where his prick is. I'm... I said, yes, Murto. I said, well, if you know that, what is the problem? She said, well, what's that round red thing on the end? I said, don't be silly, darling. I said, that's common knowledge. That's the knob. <laughs> well, it is, isn't it? The knob. She said, oh, the knob. She said, well, well, what's it there for? I said, don't be a prat. Stop your hand shooting off the fucking end. What do you think? <laughs> She said, well, if that's the knob at that end, what are those two round red things? 16 inches. I said, how many? <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be having a look at Tristram in the future, bless him. But you see, family is a big family. You know, you look after each other and, and you look after individual members. And I, I had the kids staying with me. My, my eldest sister, Delilah, her little boy, he was staying with me. And... and Foolishly, I didn't think I got up in the morning. I was going to get the milk, and, you know, we live in a secluded area. And I was just about to open the door, and suddenly I knew there was someone behind me. I turned around quickly, and he was there. The eyes were like chapel hat pegs, staring out. And I went, oh, because I was nude at the top. I, I didn't, you know. He said, oh, Auntie, what are those? I thought very quickly, being an actress. I said, um, these are Auntie's balloons. Well, what would you have told him? He's only four years old, he believed me. He said, but what are they there for? I thought, what an intelligent little person you are. I said, well, darling, when Auntie dies, Uncle blows up her balloons and she floats up to heaven. <laughs> now, that was all right until a week past Tuesday when suddenly we were staying with his mother and father and he came belting into our bedroom about five o'clock in the morning. He said, Auntie, Auntie. I said, what? He said, Mummy's dying. I said, what do you mean she's dying? He said, well, Daddy's blowing up her balloons and she's shouting, Oh, God, I'm coming. <laughs> These two Jewish women meet after quite some time. They hadn't seen each other for a while. And one said to the other, she said, Miriam, you look wonderful. She said, oh, Rebecca, please, I feel great. And Rebecca, have I got news for you? Said, Miriam, what is it? She said, do you remember Harvey Goldstone? She said, oi, do I remember Harvey Goldstone? We used to dance to Lou Preger and the band at the Hammersmith Pally, of course. 
He's back in town. Back from America? From America! How do you know? He phoned me up. I went dancing with him last Tuesday. And he's still dancing. Oi, oh, dance is a dream. That boy is wonderful. He could be Fred Asterovitz. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> she said, and? She said, well, after that, he took me for a meal. We had a little drink in one of these new wine bars. Why oh, was it swinging? And then he took me home. And that's when it happened. You don't know? Oh, yes. No sooner did I get in, he ripped my clothes off, threw me across the bed, and ravished me. He had carnival knowledge of my body. <laughs> she went, oh, she said, what's the matter? She looked worried. I said, I am worried. Of course I'm worried. Why? I'm going dancing with him on Tuesday. Do you think I should cancel? No! Wear old clothes. <laughs> Never tell. Of course, when I started in the business, I, I started as a dancer. I, I, I danced uh, oh, all over the place. And I did an audition in the West End of London for a lovely man called Buddy Bradley. And he got me a job in Paris. And I went over there. And every night, I used to leap on stage. I used to do ballet with my left leg and tap with the right. And between the two, I made a small fortune. And <laughs> One night, while walking home along the Champs-Élysées, the sex maniac stepped out from a doorway and ignored me. Yes, you may be surprised. I went round the block twice. I got the bugger in the end. Uh, he said, excuse-moi, mademoiselle, voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? I said, you what? He said, I'm asking if you'd care to come back to my place. I said, oh, yes, please. So back we went to his gaff. He opened the door. There wasn't a stick of furniture in the place. It was I floored. <laughs> he opened the door into his lounge. It was furnished in early French crap. He said, Cherie, Cherie, Cherie. Do you like cocktails? I said, oh, I'll listen to anything. As long as it's got a happy ending, I don't mind. He said, no, no. Would you like a little something between your lips? Yes, that's what I thought then. I realised he meant a bevy. I said, I have a sin and tonic. He poured me out the half pint of gin. He put a splash of tonic in it. Well, I took a couple of sips and I got, I got all girly and giggly. I was going, ah, ah. I said, here, here. He said, where? I said, here. I, I said, tell me, Jean-Claude, in Paris, do the lemons have wings? He said, no. I said, oh, in that case, I've just squeezed your canary into my gin. <laughs> See you soon. Bye-bye. Whoa! Ladies and gentlemen, can you welcome now Kevin Peters. Thank you. Oh, I say. <laughs> Listen, I'd like to ask you all a personal question. I hope you don't mind, because I'm going to ask anyway, but you know, you have to ask. How many of you like can remember losing your virginity? Me. <laughs> Please, no one's that silly. Listen, I'm going to tell you. I can remember losing my virginity like it was yesterday because I was only young at the time, so it shows you it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> I was mince... I mean, I Ladies and gentlemen, can you now welcome <laughs> Mr. Dave Lynn. Hello. I'm a drag artist. <laughs> I was a woman, then I discovered Smirnoff. <laughs> actually, I'm not, I'm not like the other ones you've seen tonight. I'm actually uh, Jewish. You may have noticed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. No, I'm Jewish. And um, actually, before I was a drag artist, I, I thought, what would I do when I left school? You know when you're at school and you're those little toilets? Do you remember those little toilets? Yeah? I went back, chickens, I went back to look and I thought, what would I like to be? And I thought, I'd like to be a prostitute, you know, lay on my back and make money. And I went to, um, I went to Greece, because I thought that's where they made KY. And, uh, <laughs> oh, for those of you who just tuned in, this is K. 
KYTV slipping into your show. <laughs> no, I was a prostitute and I was in France because I thought, well, eventually I'm going to become a star and have my name up in big French letters. And, um, <laughs> no, actually, there's a new Jewish condom out at the moment. It's got ink in the end, so if you can't come, you can write. <laughs> I'm a bit late arriving, there's so many people backstage, I'm a bit late arriving because the police stopped me on my way here tonight. I came round the one-way system, which is nice if you can do that, and um, you know what the police are like in Brighton, they suddenly appear from nowhere and there, there he was with their sign up, you know, stop police. So put my sign up, bollocks, drag queen. <laughs> I, know. I know, I dress up, they dress up. And he got out of his car. <laughs> He got out of his car and he walked around mine. You got a cough? See a doctor. Got... And he looked at my car like it was shit and he was Ajax. <laughs> and he came round to my window and I'm sitting there holding the wheel and he said, he didn't say anything actually, he looked through my window which was silly because it wasn't open yet. And he said to me, are you the driver of this car? So I thought, humour him, humour him. I said, well, it's automatic, but I have to steer. <laughs> he said, do you know anything about your highway code? I said, yes, of course I do. He said, well, what do you expect to see when you're approaching an island? I said, palm trees, sulawli, coconuts. <laughs> he said, you women drivers, you're all the same. <laughs> I thought, have I got news for you, cock? But I didn't say that. I said, now have you finished, sir? I've got to go to work. He said, oh, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a drag queen. He said, oh, fuck me. <laughs> he said, you look so much like a woman. All you need is a prat. I, s I said, well, now that I've found you, where's the pavilion in Brighton? Anyway, no, anyway, he let me go with a caution. He said, don't wear that colour again, so I'm here. And I'm, no, I'm thrilled to be here because being Jewish is difficult in, my, in this work that we do, you know, being a drag queen. I'm not a woman, for those of you who are looking at me now. These are not breasts, they're force padding. I've tucked my nine inches away tonight. To <laughs> let them record this, that's what I said. No, no, I, but my mother's here tonight and I feel very close to her. She's a Jewish woman. Jewish women do not uh, talk. They sort of go, hello? <laughs> you know, we do that, but we do it in Hampstead Heath. <laughs> and uh, uh, recently, my aunt Matilda lost her husband. Sadly, Aww. it's all right. I don't know her. And <laughs> she had him cremated, and uh, she was standing there at the graveside with his ashes in her hand. And she said, "Hi, me." He was a Pakistani man. <laughs> She said, hi, me. She said, hi, me. She said, hi, me. Do you know that fur coat I always wanted? I'm wearing it. She said, hi, me. I always wanted to see Les Miserables and you didn't. I'm going. She said, hi, me. I wanted to go around the world and back and you didn't. And now I'm going to give you something you always wanted. A blowjob. <laughs> I think being Jewish is difficult because uh, being a prostitute, when I was a prostitute before I did this for a living, because I'm a drag artist now, it was difficult because... Uh, <laughs> now you have to train, don't you, to be a prostitute? No, no, there's a woman there who knows what I'm talking about. And... Um, <laughs> You have to practice, you know. And they teach you like this, see anything you like. The first two guys nicked the bedspread. <laughs> but I, no, no, I, but I got the hang of it. I was in France, I love, I love, I love, I love the champs a lot, and, um, and the last guy I came up was a little French count. I think that's what the madam said. <laughs> and he came up and he said to me in a French accent, Madame. Although there is winter, I'm mad. There is summer, 
in my heart. I said, well, frankly, as long as there's plenty of spring in your bollocks, I couldn't give a fuck. <laughs> I'm still doing this. Are you hot? You take your jacket off, love. Try deodorant? Yes, 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 yes. Got your sandwiches, have you? It's Mandy. He said to me, Madame, I would like you to do something very special for me. I said, well, usually, love, it's 25 francs, but if you want something special, it's 30. He said, I would like you to sprinkle some water on my body. Oh, I said, all right. I've done Lego. <laughs> so I went, I got a bucket. Bucket. With water, and I went, sprinkle, sprinkle. He went, oh, mon dieu. The rain. I said, all right. Oh. <laughs> what you fancy now? I said, madame, I wonder if you could blow on me. I said, oh. <laughs> now you're talking our language. <laughs> no, he didn't want that. So I went, sprinkle, sprinkle. <laughs> <laughs> he went, oh, sacre bleu, the wind. <laughs> <laughs> Don't God, Doris has seen herself in the mirror. And, <laughs> He said, Madame. I said, yes, babes, because <laughs> you talk like that. <laughs> You're cocky, aren't you? And he said, Madame, what I'd like you to do next is get a bucket and kick it. <laughs> so I already had the bucket there, Terry, Varley. <laughs> I had the bucket there, so I went, sprinkle, sprinkle. <laughs> he went, oh, gold of my ear. <laughs> The rain, the wind, the thunder. I said, what do you want now? He said, oh, madame, could you do one more thing for me? Could you reach the light switch and switch it? <laughs> could you reach the light switch? <laughs> that was Dockyard Doris, her vest brave have just taken off. <laughs> I wonder if you could reach the last switch and switch it un and if. <laughs> I said, un and if? He said, yes, un and if. So I went, sexily, swiggle, swiggle. <laughs> kick, kick. Switch, switch. He went, ah, oh, mon dieu, the rain, the wind, the thunder, the lightning, the rain, the wind, the thunder, the lightning. I said, you fancy a fuck. He said, what, in this weather? <laughs> Actually, just before I leave it, because I'm the youngest drag act to appear tonight, so it's... <laughs> no, this is one of Dockyard's sleeves. <laughs> no, <laughs> just before I leave... Just before I leave you... No, have you been to a harvester before? No, I'm very into adverts at the moment, and I recently went to New York um, by aeroplane, because it helps. And uh, a lot of the aeroplane stuff now are gay, you might have noticed, a lot of stewards, you know, trolley dollars, you know. You can tell because they walk along and they go to the men, you know, hi sir, is there anything I can do for you? Madam, is there anything I can do for you, sir? Yeah. Yeah. And there'll be cottages. And if you can't breathe, there'll be poppers at 36,000 feet, you know. But I went to New York and I, I saw this amazing advert where a man, I think it was a man, Went up to this door, knocked on the door, you know, ring, ring. And um, a woman opened this door in a negligent, and she said, hi. Women do that because they're epileptic most of the time. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, look, I'm selling a new detergent here, and uh, I'd like to come in and demonstrate. She said, OK, come in. <laughs> so he goes inside, and he says, have you got anything that I can wash? So she takes the top of her negligent off. And he gets it and he goes, into the wash, out of the wash, into the rinse, out of the rinse, 
Into the dryer, out of the dryer, up to the nose, sweet as a rose. She said, that's fabulous. Could you show me some more? He said, sure, madam, give me another garment. So she took her bra off. <laughs> he got the bra and he went, into the wash, out of the wash, into the rinse, out of the rinse, into the dryer, out of the dryer, up to the nose, sweet as a rose. She said, that's boner. No, she said, that's wonderful. <laughs> Show me one more thing I'm going to buy your detergent because I'm bold. <laughs> the wash said not, but bold got it clean. So she took her knickers off. <laughs> Bless you, you kinky thing. He's the sort of person that dials 0898 at night. <laughs> so, he got the knickers and he went... Into the wash, out of the wash, into the rinse, out of the rinse, into the dryer, out of the dryer, up to the nose, back in the wash! Thank you! Ladies and gentlemen, can you now welcome back, please, uh, Pip Morgan as Mrs. Shufflewick. <laughs> Hello, my lovelies. <laughs> you all enjoying yourselves? Yes. yes. Good, I shall soon put a stop to that. <laughs> I better introduce myself. The name is Mrs. Shufflewick, star of stage, screen, radio, television, labour exchange and dope parties. <laughs> Part-time topless waitress <laughs> at the Frog and Nightgown in the Balls Pond Road. <laughs> and formerly known on the British Music Hall as Poppy Tupper and her educated sheepdog. Excuse me. Do you like the fur? It cost £200. I didn't pay for it myself. I met 200 men with a pound each. So I wasn't done, was I? <laughs> it's what, what's called untouched pussy. <laughs> and it is currently unavailable in the West End at this present time. <laughs> and there's not a lot of it around anywhere else as far as I can see. <laughs> but, oh no, no, oh. <laughs> no, oh God. No, do you know, I was, I was laid in bed this morning, mending, <laughs> mending a puncture. <laughs> I had a blowout. No, not a blow through, a blowout. I shall never buy those rubber guns again, I can tell you. And I had one of my hot flushes. Oh, what do I have them? Do you have them? I had to blow down my blouses on buses, oh God. Yes. <laughs> and I thought, no, the only one thing for it, glad is slip into something loose and go down to the local. Now my local, oh, you'd like my local, you don't know it, no, of course you wouldn't know my local. It's called the Cock and Comfort. <laughs> it's, it's very comfortable, but there's not a lot of anything else in there. No, and, and I, I got myself in there and I thought, oh God, give me a large brandy and I'll put my head between the landlord's knees for two minutes. <laughs> and, 
I, do you know, I, I was, I was sat sitting there about 90 minutes, not a care in the world, and oh, one of my neighbours came in. Oh, poor cow. Oh, poor cow. She was all sad and forlorn. I thought, oh, God, whatever's happened. I said, I said, Alice, God, Alice Pokeworthy. I said... <laughs> No, excuse me. I said, oh, I said, what's ever happened? She's, I said, she was crying, you see. She said, she said, I've lost my husband. I said, what, he left you, what? And she said, no, he, no, he's passed away. I said, oh, what was he? Oh, well, you know, she said, no, she said, it was Sunday morning, she said. And I was doing the dinner, and I said to him, I said, will you go down the garden? And... <laughs> I said, go down the garden, I said, and cut me a cauliflower. So he went off down the garden, and he bent down to cut this cauliflower, and he'd gone, he gone, he gone, went, dropped dead. And I said, oh dear, I said, I'm ever so sorry. I said, whatever did you do? She said, we had to open the tin of peas. <laughs> No, 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 no. Look, I haven't come up here to be laughed at, no. So anyway. And, no, and so anyway, I, no, and, and then, you know, I was, I was, I was there and, and oh, it's funny things happen in pubs because I was in there, oh, a few days ago in the cock and I was, I was, I was sitting, now I was sitting there minding my own business as you would, you know, and, and this businessman came in. Oh, he was all in a pinstripe suit and a bowler hat and a, a briefcase. Oh, it was a sort of the soul of epitome, you know. And, and, he, and he walked up to the bar and there was this barmaid there. She was a very staid woman, sort of black bombazine and, and a rope of pearls, you know. And, and he walked up to her and he said, uh, Tickle your ass with a feather. <laughs> and she said, I beg your pardon. He said, particularly nasty weather. <laughs> and and she, no, she said, she said, no, she said, I'm sorry, I misconstrued what you said, you see. And so he got a large whiskey and he went and pissed off and sat down. And this little Irishman came out of the corner and went over to him. He said, he said, excuse me, sir. He said, did I hear you right? You said to that barmaid woman, uh, tickle your ass with a feather and not particularly nice. Really. He said, oh, yes. He said, I like to start the day off with a good laugh and a giggle and all that, you know. He said, oh, thank you. And he went, I watched him. He went off into the public bar and I could see him through the mirrors. And he was sat there having a large scotches and he was going, tickle your ass with a feather. <laughs> Particularly nasty weather. Particularly nasty weather. Nasty weather. Nasty weather. Well, 20 minutes later, he was out. He was pissed as a fart. <laughs> and he come through. No, he come through and he said, he went to the barmaid, this bombazine woman, you know, the black one. And, and he said, sir. <laughs> and she said, yes. He said, Stick a feather up your ass. <laughs> she said, I beg your pardon. And he said, it's really like fuck outside. <laughs> no, but, no, but, no, no, no. Mind you, I'm ever so pleased. I've just had a letter from my young son, Ernie. I'm ever so delighted. No, no, he's, he's, he's been detained to give Her Majesty pleasure. <laughs> so she must think something of him. Mind you, he's like his father, whoever he was. <laughs> and I was eating chips at the time. <laughs> No, but no, but my, 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 my another lady friend of mine, she was in there, oh, it's a while ago now, and, and she was sort of, oh, we've got a face, oh, God, it was, well, she'd been watching Dave Lynn, actually. And, 
And I said, I said, what's the matter, girl? She said, oh, she said, I don't know. She said, it's my dog. She said, it's died. I said, what that man? She said, it's a 45 years man. She said, oh, fucking thing it was. <laughs> anyway. And I, I, she said, I don't know what to do. I'm lost. I said, well, I said, get yourself another pet. She said, oh, she said, I don't think I could take to another dog. I said, well, you don't have to have a dog. I said, get yourself something else. I said, well, nice budgery car. <laughs> I said, you have someone to talk to in the evenings. <laughs> so she went, she went down the pet shop and, and, and she, she went in. She said, um, yes, I'd like a budget car. And he said, well, yes, madam. He said, we've got these nice canary ones. She said, you know, not to be confused with the canary birds from the canary hours. He said, very nice. And she said, how much are they? <laughs> Fuck off. And, <laughs> How much are they? She says, she says, well, they're 45 pounds. She said, pass it up, I'll take it. He said, excuse me, he said, but you've got to have a cage. Oh, she said, how much is that? He said, that's 37 pounds 50. Excuse me. <laughs> so she said, oh, pa she said, wrap them up, I'll take them. And she's going out the door and she's turned around. She said, it can talk, can it? He said, oh, he said, get it home, it'll never stop. Oh, it'll never stop talking. And she, back the next morning, she said, that budgery girl I bought, she hadn't said a word. He said, well, it wants a bit of interest, doesn't it? He said, buy a mirror. So it can, it can, no, no, she he said, buy a mirror so it can look at itself and think it's another bird and ask me to, ask me to talk about, you know. Back the next morning, she hadn't said a word. He said, well, um, buy a ladder. <laughs> so it, it can run up and down the ladder, look in the mirror and run back. He said, then it'll start talking. She said, how much is that? She said, three pounds fifty. She said, I can't really afford it, but I'll have it. So she got this little, well, she was back the next day. She said, look, it hadn't said a word. He said, well, how about a trapeze? <laughs> It can swing across the cage, backwards and forwards, run up and down the ladder, look in the mirror, you know, and it'd be lovely. And she said, oh, God, how much? He said, £2.50. About the next morning, she did nothing. He said, well, how about a bell? Hang the bell over the mirror. It can swing across, backwards and forwards, on the trapeze, <laughs> run up and down the ladder, you know, uh, look in the mirror, talk to itself, ring the bell, we done talk then, well, you've had it. <laughs> well, I won't bore you, because it went on for months. I mean, the cage was... It was like fucking Bertram Mill Circus. <laughs> <laughs> and she... No, no, and she went back and, and one morning, and she said, here, she said, that budgery girl, she said, you sold me, she said, it's dead. <laughs> he said, oh, never. Oh, my God. She said, no, it's dead. Oh, he said, I'm sorry. He said, did it speak? Oh, she said, yes. Just before it went. <laughs> it opened one eye, looked up at me and said, don't they sell no fucking bird seed down that pet shop? Well, um, no, 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 don't, don't, don't laugh, no, because uh, I'm, oh, God, um, oh, that candid fucking camera, <laughs> and all this bako foil everywhere, no, anyway, uh, look, I've, I'm sorry, but I've got to pop off, because I'm, I'm not being well, because I've been at my sister's for the last few days, our oh, Lil, <laughs> poor cow. <laughs> Not, not she's not thick she's stupid really <laughs> no no i stayed there i mean she lives in a council flat oh god almighty have you ever been in a council flat the walls are so thin I, I, the other sunday you no know, i mean she was doing the joint for lunchtime and she opened her oven and the man next door was dipping his bread in her grave <laughs> No, I mean, no, she went to poke the fire and she had a boy off his bicycle outside. <laughs> don't know where the poker went. I don't think she'll get it back. <laughs> but he seemed quite happy. No, but no, the last day I was there was Tuesday and I was sort of in bed, you know, chopping a few sticks to help her out, you know. And, 
And uh, no, really, no, I was. I, oh, I can't get up. And anyway, no, and, and there she was, you know, and she came into my bedroom. She said, I'm very sorry, Gladys, she said, but I can't make you a cup of tea this morning. I said, oh, why is that? She said, well, the water's been cut off. And I said, well, it's all right. I said, I can manage, don't worry, it's all right. So she went and she came back ten minutes later with my breakfast on a tray with a serviette and doilies and, you know, a couple of boiled eggs and a bit of bread and butter and, and some marmalade. I like, I like it, you know. And now what's puzzled me, if that woman's water had been cut off, how did she boil those eggs? <laughs> And all I can say finally is, thank God I didn't have them fucking poached. Welcome, please, Pinky. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Pinky International Airways, the airline to the stars, such as Jim Reeves, Glenn Miller, and Buddy Holly, to name a few. All doors are now being locked, and they are being pointed out to you now, so there is no escape. Please don't open any doors or windows, as there is a danger of getting sucked off. Sorry. Sucked out. <laughs> Should you have need of oxygen, we have masks like these to use. Simply put it over your nose and mouth, imagining your best friend is sitting on your face. <laughs> and rim in the manner demonstrated. <laughs> if you feel faint, place your head between your legs. If you can't get it between your own legs, stick it between Pinky's and she will be very grateful. If we go down on water, life jackets are available. To inflate, pull on your red knob. Or better still, pull on the person next to you's red knob. You can top up the air by using this mouthpiece. <laughs> there is a red light here to attract trade. <laughs> and a whistle here to attract passing sailors, policemen, or anyone else in uniform. <laughs> Sick bags are available from your <laughs> stewardess. To use, Open the bag fully, bring the head back, then thrust forward in a rapid motion, covering your nose and mouth. Then throw up. Once finished throwing up, hand the bag back to the stewardess Pinky and she will dispose of its contents. Thank you for your attention. Please fasten your seatbelts now, because you're in for a bumpy ride. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, good evening. Hello. Yes, for those who don't know me, I'm Pinky, and I've just recently returned from one of my international trips. I've had a terrible night. I've been up all night on one of them flights, dear. I can't tell you what it was. You know what it was like. You, you're going through the aircraft, so there I was doing the air hostess chant, you know. Tea or coffee, 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 there you go. Chicken or fish, 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 there you go. And this fellow's pressing his call bell. He said to me, excuse me, stewardess. I said, yes, sir. He said, I've been pressing this call bell for the last 20 minutes. I said, look here, you bastard. It'll take more than two fingers to make me come. <laughs> he had me up and down that aisle. I must have been up and down that aisle 20 times. I was up and down like a horse draws, I'll tell you. And until at the end, I leaned across and I said, excuse me, sir. He said, yes. I said, could you just stick your tongue in my ear? He said, stick my tongue in your ear, whatever for. I said, because if you're going to fuck me around, I want a bit of foreplay first, dear. 
but we had a terrible moment on there. There I was, dear, down the back, serving up, and the captain had just been on the PA, you know, on his intercom doing his announcement, you know, we're playing at 39,000 feet, and we were in a very good progress, four and a half hours to go, and he forgot to turn it off. And he turned to his co-pilot, and all of a sudden he said, do you know what, Roger? He said, when I get to that hotel, I'm going to have a shit shaven shower. Then I'm going to get hold of that pink stewardess bitch down the back. I'm going to rip her, rip her knickers off and shag her till tomorrow morning. Well, I thought, oh my God, I went darting up the aisle. Woof! I was like, solar bud on heat, dear. <laughs> All of a sudden, I get to the front of the cabin and this old woman had left her walking stick out and I went flying, ass over tipped. And she said, oh, you've no need to rush, love. He's going to have a shave, shit and shower before he gets to you. <laughs> True, true, you know, and it was, it was awful, you know, because when you get these people on the flights, you know, they always think that they can fly, they want to try it. And we had this guy one day, and off he goes to the airport for his private flying lessons, and he goes up to the man, he says, Hey, I'd like to learn to fly, please. And the man says, Have you flown before? He said, No, I've never flown before, but I'd like to have a go. He said, OK, so picture the scene, they get into this little biplane. He's sitting in the front, and the pilot's sitting in the back, and they take off, and it's all going very well. All of a sudden, he hears behind him, Yeah! And he looks back, and the pilot is dead. He gets on the PA and he goes, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday! Mayday! And this guy goes, yes, yes, we read you, we hear you. What seems to be the problem? He says, the pilot's bloody dead up here! He says, where are you, my man? He said, I'm in the sky! <laughs> he said, well, I know that, whereabouts? He said, I don't bloody know the pilot's dead, I've never been in a plane on me all before, what am I gonna do? He said, calm down, calm down. He said, look at the clock on your right-hand side and tell me what it says. And he looked at the clock and he said, it says uh, NNW. And that's, he said, that's fine. You're flying in a north, northwesterly direction. He said, now look at the clock on your right-hand side and tell me what that says. He said, it says uh, 4,000! <laughs> And he said, well, calm down, man. That means you're flying in a north northwesterly direction at 4,000 feet. He said, there's nothing to panic. He said, there is anything else you can tell me to determine your position? He said, I said, I'm flying upside down. He said, how do you know? He said, because I've shit myself and it's coming out the back of me collar. <laughs> and you know... I, see, I saw in the paper the other day, Nicky Lauder, of course, has got his own airline now, Lauder Air, and he's just been interviewing for pilots. He had three um, interviewees. The first one went in and he said, good morning, my name is Nigel, I'm ex-RAF, I was in the RAF for 15 years. Ah. And Nicky Lauder said, I don't want to know all that. Look at my face and tell me exactly what you see. He said, well, Mr. Lauder, so I can't help notice you don't have any ears. <laughs> he said, next, don't call us, we'll call you, thank you. Out he goes. Next one comes in. He says, Hi, my name's Brad. I used to fly for Pan Am Airways. I don't want to know a lot. Look at my face and tell me exactly what you see. He said, Well, I can't help noticing, Mr. Lauder, that you haven't got any ears. Next! Don't call us! We'll call you! <laughs> Third he walks in. He goes, Top of the morning to you, Mr. Lauder. My name's Paddy and I used to work for Aer Lingus. <laughs> he said, Never mind all that. He said, Look at my face and tell me exactly what you see. He said, well, I can't help noticing, Mr. Lauder, are you wearing contact lenses, sir? <laughs> he says, very good, man. Why do you think I wear contact lenses? He's because you've got no fucking ears to hold your glasses up with. <laughs> well... I do like a bit of a holiday myself, and me and my husband die, of course, we come from the valleys, as you can tell. They do call me the vamp from the valleys, by the way. And uh, we went to Las Vegas, we went gambling, we were walking down the road the other day in um, Merthyr Tidville, and we saw one of our neighbours coming up to us, and he went, um, good morning, Di said, good morning. He said, I haven't seen you for a while, he went, no, we'll be on holidays. He said, where have you been, Di? went, we'll be to Las Vegas. He said, you've been where? Las Vegas, gambling. Me and Pink, we've been gambling in Las Vegas. He said, that's marvellous. He said, did you win anything? Win anything, he said? He said, I won £50. He said, £50? Yeah, he said, but this man behind me, a professional gambler, was going, let it ride, let it ride. So I let it ride. He said, what happened? I won £500. He said, £500, that's mad, I'd have paid for you and Pink's holiday. I know, but this bugger behind me, let it ride, let it ride, let it ride. He said, won £5,000. He said, you won five. Oh, that's marvellous. He said, what are you done with the money? He said, no, it's man behind me now. Let it ride. Let the ball ride. So I let it ride. 
He said, one fifty thousand pound. He said, fifty thousand? I can't believe it. He said, yes, he kept going, let it rise and more so, I won five hundred thousand pounds. He said, half a million, that is incredible. He said, I hope you took the money. He said, no, in behind now. Let it rise, let it rise, he said. He said, let it rise. He said, what happened? I mean, he said, what happened? <laughs> it's terrible when you get your trade stuck in your throat. <laughs> He said, I want a million. He said, you want a million pounds? Fantastic. He said, you didn't gamble the rest of it. He said, I said, you're going, let it rise. He said, what happened? Two million pounds, lost a lot of it. He said, what? He said, I lost every bloody penny. He said, all because of that man behind you saying, let it rise. I said, yeah, I lost every penny. I've got nothing. He said, if I did that, it'd be me. And he'd have been saying that to me. He said, I grabbed all of that bugger and I would have bitten his bollocks off. He said, yes, I'm on the second one at the moment. <laughs> You know. And whilst we were on our holidays, we thought we'd have a little cruise. We went on the QE2. We did hit the sandbag. Actually, I should call this my QE2 dress because it's roll on, roll off, and it's full of dead semen. Anyway, oh. cut that. <laughs> but we did manage to go on a little cruise. We got shipwrecked. Anyway, we could, we could all get washed up on the shore there, you see. And along shipwrecked with us, there was an Englishman, a Scotsman, and an Irishman. And the cannibal chief grabbed hold of us and he said, Right, he said, I want you all to sing me a song about a dog. If you can't sing a song about a dog, that's it. He said, fine. So the Englishman sat off first and he says, how much is that doggy in the window? He says, very good, on you go. He said to the, to the, to the, to the Scotsman, he said, right, I want you to sing me a song. And the Scotsman, daddy wouldn't buy me a bow wow. Very good, he said to the Irishman, your turn. And the Irishman went, Strangers in the night, exchanging glances. He said, that's not about a dog. He said, aye, it is. Scooby-dooby-doo. <laughs> Thank you very much. I welcome Mr Chantel, Scott St Martin. Well, here we are, dear. Here we are. Now, I knew I was coming here, actually, this evening because I had this awful dream last night. Well, it was a nightmare, actually, because Maisie was in it. Um, <laughs> no, it was shocking, actually, because I dreamt that I'd gone to heaven. Not the place with the cockroaches, but the other one. <laughs> oh, you've worked there as well. <laughs> Dave Lynn and I will tell you all about it later. Bastards. Anyway, yes, I dreamt I'd gone to heaven and I walked into the gates. I went, oh shit, that hurts. No, I walked into the gates and St. Peter was there and he said, come in and I will show you everything. So I thought, well, that's not bad, dear, but a trade. As soon as you get up here, I thought, it's quite good, really, isn't it? And I walked in there and all of a sudden I saw Dockyard Doris. And there she was, snogging with Marty Feldman. And I said, what, what is this, St. Peter? He said, well, you see, now when Dockyard was alive, she was a very, very naughty girl. And this is her punishment now. So we walked a little further along. And I saw Dave Lynn. And he was snogging with Quasimodo. <laughs> and I said, but St. Peter, what is this? What can this be? Because I'm a classical actress, you see. What can this be? said, now, when Dave Lynn was alive, she was a very, very naughty girl, and this is her punishment. And we walked along a little bit further, and I saw Maisie Chollet snogging with Tom Cruise. <laughs> and I said, hang about, girl. I said, there must be something wrong here. Doc, you know, something must be wrong. I said, why? Why is Maisie? Was Maisie such a wonderful, wonderful person when she was on this earth? She said, no, but Tom Cruise was a right bastard. <laughs> no, please, please don't. No, actually, I'm, I'm just recovering. I've just been on holiday, actually. I went on holiday with Dockyard and Maisie this year. It, I knew it was going to be bad as soon as we started because the boyfriend booked the tickets. Virgin Airways. Who the fuck wants to go on an airways that doesn't go the whole way? 
when I sat at 69, I thought, this can't be bad, this is all right. Get there, we're trolling along the beach. Or as, as Miss M, anyone remember Miss M? Bless her. Anyway, yes, well actually, no, we were on the beach and Dockyard was sunbathing and Greenpeace rescued her. And... Uh, <laughs> thank you, Colin. No, we were walking along and all of a sudden we saw this phenomenon. Now, at this time of night, that is very difficult to say, especially after 14 pints of lager in the cupboard backstage. It's very intimate backstage, actually. I've, uh, I bent over once and I'm now having Nicky Young's love child. <laughs> Lovely. And anyway, we watched along and we saw this merman. So I th this is absolutely amazing. So Dockyard went up to the merman and said, um, excuse me, he said, um, have you ever been fondled before? And he went, no, senor, because she spoke Spanish, you see. She's strange being in Spain. And he said, no, no, senor. So she, Dockyard did a bit of the old farm pull down and everything. And then Maisie went up and said, excuse me, he said, uh, have you ever been kissed before? He said, no, senor, I've never been kissed before. I don't know why she spoke with a French accent then either. And, <laughs> and I went up and I said, hola, que tal, muy bien, because I do the palabra, you see, because I'm flash. <laughs> And uh, she said, uh, no, no, I said, I, have you ever been fucked before? <gasps> no, senor, I have never been, how oh, you say, fucked before. I said, well, you are now, because the tide's out. <laughs> Then, of course, it got bad to worse, because I had to go, we were all on the plane together, and the embarrassing thing happened. I'm sure some of you, I know Terry Varley's had the same situation, as I can see her sitting over there with the glasses reflecting in the lights there. And she's not wearing the earrings that I bought her last year, so I'm not speaking to her. <laughs> and, of course, the embarrassing thing happened when we get to the old customs men. Bastards. We get there, they open the case, and what is there but the vibrator? Madam, you obviously know what I'm talking about. She went, oh, she's talking about me. No, it was the vibrator lying there. I was as cool as a cucumber, pardon the pun, Terry. And, uh, and I looked straight in the guy's eyes. Wait for it. I looked straight in the guy's eyes and I just said, yes. And I still can't find out how to work the oven with it yet. <laughs> bless her, bless her, dear. Anyway, moving right along, the other holiday I went on, I went with a straight man. I know. Bless them. I don't mind. Their sex life revolts me, but I don't care. We went to Amsterdam. Of course, he starts getting horny. So he decides he's going to go to a brothel. So he walks into the brothel and they get gilders, isn't it, they have over there? Speak to me, people. Yes. I won't bite. Might give you a nasty suck, but I won't bite. <laughs> gilders, yes. So he goes in there and he says, I have one gilder. He says, what can you do? He said, well, nothing. He said, have you got anything else? He said, all right, well, I've got two gilders. She said, well, Follow me upstairs. They go upstairs to room 22, puts him in the room, everything's fine. Closes the door, madam goes downstairs, and all there is in there is a chicken. So he looks around and he thinks, well, two gilders, I mean, you can't really grumble about this. So in the end, gets down and does the business with the chicken. A week later, he's passing this very same brothel, and walks past and he goes, well, I'm feeling a bit horny again. I, I think I've had a pop in again. So he goes and he says, I've only got one gilder. Honestly, I only have the one gilder. She says, well, I suppose maybe we can do something for you. If you'd like to follow me upstairs, we go to room 32. You can't miss it. It's the room above number 22. Goes upstairs, closes the door. The room is full of smoke. All you can see is an old man bending over, looking down a hole. <laughs> Maisie isn't in this gag, actually, before we go any further. <laughs> and he thinks, well, let's have a look. So he looks down this hole, and all he can see are 14 nuns abusing themselves with candles. <laughs> and he looked nice slings for me, and I went, oh, uh, yes, what would you like? And she said, he said, oh, I like very much you do, 69. I said, you can fuck off if you think I'm cooking at this time of night. <laughs> Then, of course, Maisie, she doesn't like this to be known, but Maisie was on the game with me as well, of course. And uh, she was in next door in the room, and I overheard, because, you know, if you put a glass to the wall, it's true, and if you do it at Roland House, anyway. <laughs> 21 St George's Terrace. As Lily says, the rooms are so damp, they keep otters as pets. <laughs> so, that's, that's a plug for you, Maisie, all right, dear. 
Anyway, she's there and I can hear her and she says, um, she says, oh, oh yeah. She does all the Polari, you see. She's watched too many of those movies, the cult movies. She says, oh yeah, wouldn't you like to put one finger inside me? And this guy says, well, yeah, okay, fine. Wouldn't you like to put another finger inside me? Goes, yes, okay, fine. He says, wouldn't you like to put one hand inside me? Well, yeah, that, that's fine, yeah, fine. It's one hand. He said, wouldn't you like to put the other hand inside me? He said, yes, fine. So he puts the hand inside. He said, Maisie said, now, clap. He says, I can't. He said, yes, I'm tight, aren't I? <laughs> So I'm never going on holiday with Maisie again, but I'll tell you one place I'm not going, and that is to America, because the shocking things you read about in the newspapers. I read about this cowboy the other week who was captured by the Indians, which is very painful, apparently. <laughs> captured by the Indians, and this, the Indian chief stripped this man naked and buried him up to his neck in the sand. He said, you, you very brave man, before you die, I give you one request. He said, well, I'd actually like to speak to my horse, if that would be at all possible. So I said, you speak to your horse. Come the horse, leans down. The horse dashes off into the distance, comes back with a naked woman. The naked woman jumps off the horse, sits on the man's face, and wriggles for five minutes. Jumps back on the horse, disappears. Well, the Indian chief is just, doesn't know what the hell's happening. He says, you very clever man, you able to talk to your horse. He said, you are uh, able to have one more request. He said, well, I'd like to talk to my horse again, please. So, calls the horse over. The horse kneels down like this, puts his head down, and the cowboy nuts the horse straight in the head, and he said, you stupid bastard. I said, posse. I thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> can you welcome Maisie Trollette. Well, 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 this does make a change to my usual job. Well, a few years ago, I used to be a lady of the streets. <laughs> of course, when I was young and attractive, and I had a wonderful gimmick. I had a wonderful pitch in Bayswater. And I had this incredible, ugly-looking bulldog for protection, you know. And I used to trawl up and down the Bayswater Road. And one day, it's amazing, this gorgeous, gorgeous, wonderful, beautiful white jag pulled up. And this gentleman sort of wound the window down. And I looked down and he said, hi there. And I said, hello. He said, how much for the pretty one? I said, oh, 25 pounds. They took the fucking bulldog. <laughs> So I thought I'd, I'd go into the legitimate stage, you know, and sort of come on and doing, you know, chat shows and all this kind of things and telling jokes. And I was quite amazed tonight because they were very good to the Irish people. There wasn't too much of, you know, sending the Irish people up, which is strange, really, because I have friends in Ireland. I had friends who'd just been on holiday and they come back and tell me terrible things what had happened. I mean, like his brother-in-law, one of my friend Patrick, his brother-in-law was, was running down the road in Kerry the other day and, oh, for about six miles chasing this fire engine. And the fire engine's going like... Up there, and the bell is ringing, and after six miles, he falls exhausted back into the hedge and calls out, All right, all right, keep your fucking ice cream. <laughs> I, I, they, and they go on about, they go on about the Irishman, about, did you hear about the Irish flasher? He put his raincoat on back to front and got fucked. And I, got, I mean, these are the kind of things that you think you want to say when you're doing a church convention, and the Jewish joke's always about, there's always Golda and her friend walking through Golda's Green, going through this beautiful, beautiful park, and all of a sudden the flasher jumps out, opens the mat, whoosh, and Golda said, oh, Rachel, did you see that? She said, such beautiful lining. <laughs> amazing, it's amazing. Mind you. I was all ever, I was going to do this, or I, I was going to sort of join the, the convent and, you know, you know, we have a convent just behind a little place that I'm working at at the moment, and which I won't mention, uh, thank you. And uh, <laughs> I have a sister doing wonderful things, wonderful things, out in Africa or any place that she is sent, and she is a lady, a lady of the cloth, you see, and uh, one particular time, always oh, about a month ago, I believe, I got messages with 
dreadful thing had happened to her. She'd been out there looking after these little children and, and doing wonderful things. And, and she realized after three weeks, she had not bathed. And she looked up to the heavens and she said, Lord, direct me to some place where I can wash my body so I am clean for you to behold me when I pray. And sure enough, she couldn't believe it because she just parted all these, these jungle bushes and there was this beautiful waterfall and this pool and she thought, thank you, Lord. And she, she dropped all, all the habit and there she is, quite a young girl, my younger sister, with still beautiful firm breasts and in a lovely tight, oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and she immersed herself into the pool, into the water, and she's bathing herself and it's going over her breasts and her breasts are getting really hard and she thought, Lord, you're looking down at me. I am betrothed to you. And she said, don't let me have these kind of thought. And then she stopped because all of a sudden, this voice, this voice, she thought, I can't believe it. There was this incredible, <laughs> and Tarzan swung through, <laughs> swung through the jungle on this, on this big creeper. And as he dropped down to the pool beside her, the loincloth went up and she saw this amazing dong swinging there. Great big dong. And she thought, Lord, you should not make... You should not be looking at these things because she could feel her, her legs opening and, and the bubbles coming from her fanny doing the pass out. <laughs> no, this is not. And somehow, with her being from England and him being from the jungle, they understood what was happening. And Tarzan said, I've never seen anything like that before. And she looked up and she said, And I've never seen anything like that before. And Tarzan said, you making thing do funny things because he started getting this marvelous hard on and it got bigger and bigger and really big like the good old-fashioned joke like a baby's arm with an orange on the end of it and she could not believe what was happening and she said Tarzan with that big thing being stiff what do you do to get rid of the stiffness Tarzan said, Tarzan, get big thing and go over to tree in the forest with the big hole and put big thing in the hole and boom, uh, backwards and forwards. And after a while, the thing goes all limp. She gets out of the pool, the water dripping all over her body. She stands up near this palm tree. She opens her legs and she said, Tarzan, this must be the will of God. She said, because never again do you have to put the big thing in the hole to get rid of the swelling. You can put that in here. And Tarzan looked down at it. Oh, looks good, he says. Yes, she said, come on, Tarzan. She couldn't believe her eyes with this. He turned around. He, he ran about 50 yards away from her. She said, Tarzan, Tarzan. And then all of a sudden he stopped. And he whipped off the loincloth. Now, can you imagine? 14 inches of dong coming towards you. <laughs> big and thick and really heavy. And her legs are opening, and as I said before, the fanny's doing the passa doble and really, <laughs> oh, and it's getting nearer this marvelous 14 inch dick with the, oh, the, the, the baby's on, oh, and she gets near, and just as he gets near to her, he stops and he gets up his right foot and he goes, pow! And he kicks her right in the prat, right? <laughs> well, the wax flew out of her ears. <laughs> Her eyes started watering as she slid down the tree. She said, what did you do that for? He said, had to get rid of squirrels first. <laughs> oh. I suppose, yes, thank you, thank you. I suppose these are the kinds of things what happen these days. I mean, as, I mean, and parking, you all know what parking's like in Brighton. This happened, my sister rang me the other day. She said, Maisie dear, she said, the parking problem. She said, you know that naff calf, she said, just outside the bungalow. I said, yes, yes, you've eaten there evidently. And I, and I said, yeah, oh, she said the other day, she said, you'd never believe it. She said, this, this lorry pulled up, just like the Yorkie advert. She said, 
and and this guy is sitting there she, with with the ripped white vest, you know, and I could just see from where he's sitting that the jeans were all torn and he was all sweaty and he'd been driving all night and he's right outside the bungalow and he was then getting down and onto the steps and I saw the very firm buttocks and the big, big boots. Oh, you know, the heavy, really heavy boots, just like the killing of Sister George. And, I thought, <laughs> and, and, and he's getting down and I thought, oh, he's going into that dreadful have to eat when I have such beautiful food here and she's she's actually she's hanging out of the window you see and she's got this negligee on a beautiful white negligee that I bought her with a great big black fur around the bottom <laughs> to keep her neck warm and, I got, <laughs> and she's hanging out and the negligee was just open enough so that sort of one breast was resting on the windowsill and the other one was there and as he got out she called Cooey Cooey anyone was that? me Cooey Cooey and he came across and the muscles were rippling and there was all the oil and dirt on him and he said, you want me? She said, she said oh, yes, she said, don't go in there. She said, lots of people have got food poisoning. She said, she said come in here. She said, come round to the back. She said, go upstairs and have a nice shower. Put on a nice dressing gown and I'll cook you a gorgeous breakfast. And by this time, you see, the breasts were really hanging up. In fact, she had a blue tit on one of them. And, and that's... <laughs> It wasn't that cold, by the way. And, it was, and, and he said, you need to go? She said, yes, yes, come along. So he went round the back, he went upstairs. He thought, oh, I'm on a good thing here. You know, I could smell the bacon crackling and the smell of the mushrooms and the fresh bread rolls. And he had a good shower and he came down with this white, white, beautiful toweling gown. And she could see he was getting excited because she had this big bunch here. And then he sat down and he started eating the breakfast. And she said, is it all right? He said, oh, it's wonderful. It's really lovely, you know. And she, and, and, and again, the breasts were open. He thought, "Oh, I'm really, I'm in here." And, and she said, "Do you know, I'm being very naughty." She didn't. And she stood around next to him. She said, "I just noticed when you're when the dressing gown opened that you're wearing wife fronts." He said, "Yeah, I am." Yes, she said, "That's a terrible fetish of mine." She said, "Do you mind if I slip my hand into the left and if I fondle your left ball while you're eating?" <laughs> And he says, no, no, no. Well, by this time, the other John Thomas is pressing into his belly button, you see. And he says, this is wonderful. She slid her hand in, she fondling his, his right ball, you see. And then she oh, she said, I, 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 do you mind? She said, also, if I get my right hand, she said, and slip that in these wife fronts and fondle on your other ball. He said, oh, no, no. He's up the fucking marmalade by now. He's oh, hurry up. That's <laughs> Upstairs, and there he could feel her bouncing both his balls in her in her hands, and all of a sudden she went pow, bang both his bollocks together. Well, again, well you can you can tell where the marmalade went everywhere. And sausage the egg come up, and he said, "Go, my God, what did you do that for?" She said, "Don't park outside my bungalow anymore." <laughs> These kind of things can go on and on and I've got a nice hot coffee sort of going through there and I've had wonderful trips as like Mr. Scott and Martin and everyone when we could mention through there and I've just been on holiday as well. I had a tour in the jungle and there's wonderful things you see. I mean, animals always look after each other. There was one particular day I'd been on safari and this great big elephant had evidently gone through this path and, and trod on a thorn and this thorn went into this elephant's foot and it was poison as it was going further and further and this poor little elephant a lady elephant she was going oh no 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 that was Tarzan and, and, and <laughs> well he'd been riding on the elephant earlier you see and she sort of caught on very quickly and anyway the elephant then he said I'm gonna die I'm gonna die I'm gonna die well you know that elephants are supposed to be frightened of mice you see or, and, 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 and sure enough this little mice come and said Mrs. Elephant if you can trust me, she said, I can get that thorn out for you with my very, very sharp teeth. I can get this thorn out and you will live. And the elephant said, oh, we'll do anything and, and anything. And if you can do this for me, I'll do anything. So he lifts up the foot and this dear little mouse gets his little sharp teeth and she gets this around this thorn and she, mm, and she pulls it out. And the elephant says, oh, that is wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Mouse. Oh, that's all right, Miss Elephant, he says. Now, what about the favour that you said I could have? Any favour? So she said, yes, what would you like? He said, I'd like to fuck you. <laughs> 
Well, all, all, all the rest of the animals have been watching this. I mean, you can just imagine, you see, with, with all these monkeys in the palm trees and everything else all around it. <laughs> Having hysterics, you can hear all this noise. But she said, you want to what? He said, oh, yes, please. She said, how on earth are you going to fuck me? He said, well, I can run up your leg. He said, if you lift your tail up, I can put one little claw in one side and one in the other, and then I can fuck you. Well, the poor elephant, she sort of tried to put the trunk over her mouth, so you're not going to laugh, you see, and so she said, okay, come on. So up goes the little elephant, all the way up the... Up, no, the little mouse went up the elephant. <laughs> 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 the little mouse goes up, and, 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 the, and the elephant lifts up her tail, and this, and this little mouse goes, Nyew! and gets one in, and then, Nyew! And he starts, he's gone away. That Well, these monkeys by this time are having hysterics. <laughs> and then, look at that cheeky little fuck, look at that. He said, right. He said, come on, we'll have him off here. So they get hold of one of these bloody great coconuts, right? And they say, just about watch this. And they aim this coconut and go, Phew! dreadful aim, went straight past the back of the elephant, smacked the elephant right behind the ear, and caught it hurt, didn't it, eh? She goes, oh! And the little mouse looked around and said, sorry, darling, I didn't know you were a virgin. <laughs> Good night, <laughs> Good.